All right, Mark, thank you for, for this very interesting talk. Unfortunately, I have some bad news for you. There have been some technical problems while streaming your video onto YouTube. So actually just some minutes ago, it, it, it started working. So is there a chance that you just summarize what you said before in two minutes, like quickly summarizing <laughs> to give a chance to people that what, you talk, what you've been talking about? Uh, I'll try. Uh, okay, so I, um, I was talking about with um, with large geometric data sets, it becomes really difficult to inspect these properly uh, with a mouse and keyboard. So we propose that you use virtual reality to inspect these large data sets because it can it can be easier to navigate and turn the models around and look at these. But another issue with using virtual reality is that it requires great performance, uh, especially compared to a desktop uh, application. So we need to look into which approach gives us the highest performance. Is it worth it to create your own software or can you just use Unity or Paraview? And the conclusion is that uh, it, with uh, a lot of work, you can get better performance than Unity in most cases, but Unity gives you a, a quick way of getting something up and running that actually performs uh, quite well. So then I have a question for you regarding your future work you said, if you put a lot of effort into it, you can make this run really fast. So what would be the first step in your opinion to start with? I mean, you said there's a lot to do and a lot of things to build up. Yeah, so um, I think one of the, since 2018, um, the Turing architecture and the RDNA2 architecture from AMD, they have, an, they have exposed a mesh shading pipeline to uh, all of us users. And this has not really been put that much to the test. And I really feel like the, the, the way to reap some of the low hanging fruits is to investigate this way of, of uh, mesh representation, because it can really give you some powerful abilities and it gives you a lot of freedom to uh, show parts of the mesh or, or visualize uh, it the way you want to. Mm -hmm. uh, you showed three examples and I would say they're more or less a bit academic. Uh, so um, what would you say would be a very natural uh, application in terms of like real world data set? A real world uh, data set, I think the one that comes to mind first is uh, construction. So when you're building large um, skyscrapers or, or new buildings, it, it's really important to be able to go out to the, to the construction site and maybe view sort of the model before it's built. But, and that can be done with AR as long as you're only looking at the ground floor. But what if there's you know 40 stores stores and you want to go up top? Then then uh, this is a, a way to uh, approach that with virtual reality. All right. Okay. So if there are no further questions and I don't see further questions, I would like to say sorry again for the inconvenience and uh, thank you again for your nice talk. And uh, we would process to the next talk from Yigyan Yigyan. Thank you for having me. All right, our next talk is um, on the gap between visualization research and visualization software in high performing, uh, performing computing centers. And this talk is given by Gnan uh, Gnuen, and we will have the recording now, and then she will ask you some, uh, she can answer some questions. So the stage is yours. Parallel computing system has a crucial role in many applications, such as a simulation science that require massive amount of computation. These systems are extremely complicated due to the amount of computer nodes or the interaction between system and its user. It's crucial for administrators to monitor the system operations because they need to quickly recognize dangerous failure happen to the system, such as burnout or harmful activity, so they can have the appropriate solution. Along with computer strain and automatic monitoring, visualization also combines human recognition abilities into the monitoring process. 
The visualization have the administrators gain insight into the system through the visual representation and interaction, so they can understand the system situation before making any decision. So, what are prominent tasks important for monitoring SVC system? That's one. Provide spatial and temporal overview across host tracks and other facility over a given period of time. Task 2. Allow system administrator to filter by time series features or system troubleshooting. Task 3. Provide visual representation of how jobs run, behave, and progress over time. Task 4. Compare and construct the resource uses of different users and jobs in real time. Task 5. Inspect the correlation of scheduling information versus search short metrics via multidimensional analysis. Task 6. Interact with automation component. We have developed prototype of framework components and have implemented preliminary tools for the use case. Currently, the High Performance Computing Center at Texas Tech University has 465 nodes with 36 core per node. The health metric and the job information collected with Redfit ABI and UGA REST ABI. Then the data is saved in the Influx database and have been analyzed using our visualization. Hyperview is the first web page application we developed. The top right panel supports movie review feature such as post, fast forward, and restart. In the middle, we use radar chart to illustrate multidimensional data summary chart. The unique feature of this application is bundle on the compute that has same characteristic and can interact directly in the summary chart. When hover any element in the main component, a tooltip will pop up and display that compute timeline and its radar chart over time. There are three types of summary chart available, box plus, Radar with bundle and radar with summary. Because the abnormal activity is usually detected by observe, the unexpected increase or decrease of any metric. We provide a shutdown filter to highlight the computer over the filter threshold. We provide some data sets which can pick up over the left panel. User can change the main component layout for ordering by rack or cluster to Disney plot. In this visualization, its computer radar will move to its cluster by similarity visualization metrics such as cluster with high fan speed or high temperature. Also, to track the nodes and user, Hyperview provide a filter by user. This filter can help to study user behavior and optimize computing resources. For instance, if we want to track this high job lot radar, by clicking into the cluster bundle in the summary chart, the radar will be isolated. Additionally, only the user using that node will be present in the user lead panel on the right. This snapshot summarizes the system on February 17, 2020, which contains a total of 134496 data points. In particular, the main view provides an overview of all commuting nodes versus the current running job and associated users. We can trigger the radar timeline using the left control panel. When mousing over a timeline, we can observe the important information of a particular compute, such as the compute 1220. The red radar represents abnormal operating state, which requires high CPU uses. This visualization can enhance the process of, of visually detecting abnormal patterns in the monitoring data, with option grouping by similarity. The computing nodes with similar state transition patterns will be grouped together to provide even more compressed views. 
When overlay job information on the timeline, represent at Raven, one can easily note the association of job development versus high CPU uses for the user, which can be interactively verified via a simple mark click. So places in the middle of the surrounding nodes, which are grouped into 10 racks. A node has two visual sites that carry useful information, the outline thickness and the color. The more job is running on the node, the thicker the outline is. The outline thick can give information about the job scheduling. For example, we observe that some nodes have made five more than one job, while an order is some unused nodes in the system at the same time. There are nine health metrics of the nodes in the system. Two CPU temperature, inlet temperature, for fan speed, memory reduces, and power consumption. In this case, the color indicates the fan speed. The red means the high fan speed. We can use a short button to shorten the node by the current visual metric. It is notable that the four nodes has extremely high fan speed in the rack number 4. This not have the IP were related to each other and running by different user. In this, these not have been allocated in the same chest. The CPU temperature of the node 4.23 start increasing to reach the peak at the 10.35. And the 10.35 we can see that 4 fan speed of 4 nodes also grows before reaching the peak at 11.40. Usually, the CPU temperature will be lower than the CPU 1 temperature using cooling array of the node. However, the node 4.33 have the high CPU2 temperature. The CPU2 temperature dropped at 11.45. The 4 fan speed of the 4 nodes also reduced at this point. We want to see all the metrics at the same time. On the visualization section, chose time radar. This option display is not by radar chart that shows all 9 metrics of corresponding nodes. The nodes are classified based on their metric. It turned out that 3 or the north 4.34, 4.35, 4.36 has low CPU 1 and CPU 2 temperature, but the fan speeds are very high. The reason of those nodes have been hit up due to the north overheat in this event is the north 4.33. The correlation between CPU 2 temperature of the north 4.33 and the 4 fan speed of the 4 nodes imply that these nodes stand near each other. So sensor in the fence can feel the temperature from the north 4.33. After reports discovery to the server management, we found out the reason behind the overheat event of the north 4.33 is a bad implementation when replacing the CPU2 on that node. I am using the Scanotic Viewer for SBC dataset. On the control menu, I chose to display the island score and show the time series of this score for scatter plot of CPU2 temperature and the first fan speed. If we look at the time series on the timeline, we can see that value of RN score are high on Tuesday 18. There may be regular event on this day. We can move the timeline toward this day instead of waiting the animation running from the beginning. We can also modify the color scale to suitable rank for easier to observe the change in the island score. Then, just click start the animation. At 3.10 am, the island score of some plots increasing is significantly as the color turns to red. Scatter the plot between the four fan speed at very high score because some nodes has an extremely high value of fan speed. If we look at the column of CPU temperature, we can find out that the CPU2 of the node 4.33 is regular hot compared to others. Also, other three nodes have had high value in fan speed, but they have low CPU2 temperature. In fact, these three nodes located near the node 4.33 in center, so they can feel the heat from the node. 4.33. As a result, their fans work harder to reduce the temperature. So, with Scanotic Viewer, we can easily to find out that the CPU 4.33 behave regularly from the 3.10 a.m. on Thursday 18. In conclusion, in this paper, we discussed the general required for management a high-performance computing center share the experience working with academic and industrial experts in this domain 
and present various case studies for visualization. We have proposed various visual solutions during the course of two years and getting feedback through our weekly meeting. The visualization tackle different aspects of SBC system, such as computer health metric, job scheduling, resource allocation, and their association. In general, we would like to avoid the steep learning curve and provide a holistic overview of the system before digging into the detail of an event of interest for system debugging. Beside the main step and use case, there are another subtask and going on consideration that arise during the course of two years for this project. We will research these considerations and challenges in future work, include job scheduling and resource management visualization, customized and personalized visualization, and energy awareness visualization. Thank you for your attention. All right, thank you for a very interesting talk. And let's start right away with the question. So there is a question from Thomas Wischke and he's interested in, are the visualizations used for post-mortem analysis or does it allow for on-the-fly analysis that can have a closed feedback loop to optimize the system while tasks are running? Yeah, the, um, our visualization, some of it can uh, have the real-time performance, such that the job viewer or the, um, or the, the, or the, like the spiral layout, though as the new uh, visualization. And actually on the application, if you click on the link, we have the button called real-time. Uh, right now we need the, um, the VPN connect to the TTU, which is the Texas Tech University in order to see the real time. But yes, we have um, the, the on-fly technique for that. All right. Um, Robin Mark is interested in, uh, is your method scaling well with huge and small data centers? Um, yes, um, the answer is yes. Uh, we are currently working with Dell and um, our, some of our techniques already have been embedded in their system, such as the time, ra uh, the time radar and uh, the parallel uh, coordinate. And uh, for another visualization, such as um, the job view again, uh, we um, you noted that we have a layout for the central list, it can grow. And uh, the central for um, the circle for the rack, it also can repopulate for more compute, not only for 467. And uh, also we can use, um, we can adapt with the uh, CSV format, which is uh, we receive the data from Dell in the CSV format and we can load it into the system. All right, thank you for the answer. Uh, I just have one other question, which I would say, uh, what if I open up a new computing center or high performance computing center? What would you say is the most important thing I should think about if I really want to implement or have some visualization software? What should I be aware of if I'm starting something new in that direction? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. So uh, talk about the uh, setup uh, to get the uh, visualization. Actually, it's quite simple. I already showed the system that uh, we, actually the visualization just need two things. First one is the database. We're collecting the data for visual. And the second thing is we need an ABI to, in order to visualization can request the data from. Uh, that's it. And uh, a thing that you need to care when you uh, see about a visualization. Um, I have I have heard this question a lot. So but I think that you have to think, first of thing is uh, they usually concern about the power consumption or the temperature. Because uh, if you did not, not think about or did not modify body during about the temperature, your system may be burned now, like some of the use case that I have been shown. Or about the power consumption, uh, when you use uh, some of the user really not concerned about the setting about running the job. So they can consume a lot of power. 
why another user um, they they just have very important job but they cannot never run or when they run we uh, we don't know of the the power or etc like that so each user have a different pattern and um, the subtask is the, I also noted that the subtask uh, they usually care about the user what they are doing not actually that uh, in particular code but just in general for example like uh, the people in the bio field uh, where uh, whenever they need more memory or they need more CPU or they need more storage. So they usually concern about that when they're running the, the high performance computer center. All right, thank you. So uh, cons uh, considering time, we need to move on to our capstone. And uh, I would like to thank you again for your talk. And before we go for the capstone, I would like to make an announcement. So um, fortunately, uh, Mark said he's willing to give his talk again at the end uh, of the session. So anyone who's interested in staying some minutes longer and just uh, listening again to uh, Mark's talk, you're very welcome to do that. And I'm going to go through the talk with you again. All right. So let's go for the capstone first. All right, okay, let's come to our capstone, which will be given by Benedict Kempen. Uh, I would first like to introduce you to Benedict Kempen. He's an uh, um, employee of the Empolis Information Management Company, and he's a team leader of the Healthcare Analytics Group. And uh, since 2006, he's working with intelligent systems. He did his PhD from the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. And his research interests are mainly in natural language processing, knowledge graphs, and cloud computing. And if you're interested in the company and what uh, Benedict is, has to do with visualization or is interested about visualization uh, topics, you're going to uh, listen to his talk now. And there you go. The stage is yours, Benedict. Christina, thank you very much for this nice introduction and uh, you all, thank you very much for listening. I feel honored to give a keynote at this workshop. Keynotes are always a great um, um, medium to bridge different communities. And both during my time at academia and industry, I surely used a lot of visualizations, but without actually giving much thought about it. This presentation gave me an opportunity to reflect on the role visualizations had for me to at least give you an impression of what drove me to use a visualization. As a caveat, um, I'm not much involved in research communities nowadays. The views described are purely my own. And if views, opinions are heavily simplified, if my slides uh, show only a very uh, high level overview of what I did and do not go into much technical details, please be with me. Do not feel insulted. I'm well aware of the effort it takes to make progress or impact in research and to do really in-depth analysis. And second, my some of my slides are in German since I wanted you to see how I've actually presented these slides. But first, I would like to show you a little bit of what Empolis, the company that I work for, is mostly burning for. And for that, I show a short video now. I hope you also hear something. Hey, uh, we've had a problem here. Just say again, please. <laughs>
So each of you make around 20,000 decisions every single day. And some of them are important. Some of, most of them maybe not too much, but some of them really can make a huge difference. And um, especially in, in business, wrong decisions increase risks, cause damage or hinder success. Uh, sometimes with very serious and dramatic consequences. And 60% of executives worldwide think that uh, we do as many right decisions as wrong decisions. And um, so these are just examples of how important it is to think about how you, how you make decisions in business or in academia. And why is that? It's just because we have so much data available. Uh, as a basis for decisions. And um, to, to deal with this data and you as the computer visualization community, you, you uh, know it very well, is, is that if we as humans uh, are overwhelmed by information that then we would rather make wrong decisions. And um, we as Empolis, we, um, we have a kind of vision that uh, no one must ever make wrong decisions again because we utilize all information to provide the right recommendations. And of course, this is a vision. Uh, no one um, will reach it and probably no one wants to reach it because sometimes you don't want to make the right decision because you want to do another one for emotional reasons maybe. And uh, just a quick overview of uh, Empolis. Um, I, I living in Würzburg um, in Bavaria and uh, with around 200 employees and um, our main quarter in Kaiserslautern. Um, we are in a way big enough to accomplish great things. Uh, we have very huge um, customers uh, like uh, BMW, the uh, Bundesverwaltungsamt. So we, we, for the Bundesverwaltungsamt, we, we store the passenger name records, like the, the, the people flying from place to place. And this data is getting analyzed for, for um, threats. So this really is big data. But on the other hand, we also are small enough to, to be fast and flexible and to, to really also look into, into research and um, uh, think about um, how to get research results into um, industry. In, in this talk, now having heard what decision support means to Empolis, I will now first look at visualization in decision support from my perspective during my time at academia. Then I will look at the perspective I gained so far working in the industry. I spent around five years in academia, five years in industry, so there will not be a large bias at least. And my goal is to find differences in the role visualizations play for me during these times. And as I said, I'm a mere user of visualizations. But users are all that matter, right? And so I hope to give you some inspiration of how to make more impact. And uh, what is the beginning? Um, of course, it's, it's, it is this information overlaid, overload that we are all speaking about, um, that um, we as humans, our brains um, can uh, work with certain information better than with others. And with uh, visualization, we get well very well because uh, we can um, pr process it uh, in a parallel well. Um, you, you know that better than I. And um, for me, um, how would I define visualization? Um, I would define it, um, or in academia, I also know that from, from uh, lecturers at KIT, for example, um, that I gave um, um, decision support. I would um, distinguish in, in, um, in three dimensions, like uh, data representation for the one um, where you have text, feature vectors, labels, or graphs, or uh, 
anything else. You have tasks for decision support, uh, like classification, recommendation, clustering, and so on. And you have, you have the method. And the method that we are looking at today is information visualization techniques. And these are typically, um, as I uh, see it, uh, you probably have a different viewpoint. But for me, it is, for example, this extract, visualize, analyze loop of analysis uh, of gray or the information seeking mantra of overview first, zoom and filter, then details on demand. And um, like this interactive part of the definition of uh, visualization, I also like a lot. Why is information visualization not so easy? It's because um, spreadsheets um, that you probably would, um, or at least in business, um, would many people would immediately uh, use um, if they want to uh, give decision support over data. Um, Excel sheets are not always the best solution. I remember well this um, um, uh, the capital freeze index. There was an Economist article from 2013 where the Economist had uh, published some information information um, and had had to um, draw back afterwards because they had some errors in their Excel sheets. Um, and also uh, on the right side, uh, these uh, um, Excel sheet, you don't see it, but it actually contains one million um, rows. And this typically doesn't do well either. If we have visualization, um, in, my, in my lectures, I, I would typically ask uh, how many dimensions are displayed here. Um, the, the, the problem here, you would have five dimensions actually, and um, uh, above uh, five dimensions to represent them visually so that humans can understand them is very difficult, uh, as, as it seems to me. Um, one solution, of course, you see on the right side, we do um, pivot analysis and we aggregate, aggregate over certain uh, dimensions and then uh, allow this overview for a zoom and filter details on demand. And I have to say that this already is a really great technique. Um, when, when I think about applications, um, I, I tend to have a very, I try to abstract a lot. I remember our first keynote in the morning and there was this abstract, abstract, abstract. And I, I, I like that actually, um, because you, all, you always can uh, overcomplicate things. Um, and uh, for me, the, one of the reasons I started studying computer science in 2003 was that um, I thought with computer science, just one line of code and a lot of data, you can build huge things. You can basically change the world. Uh, this has fascinated me so much that I really wanted to study it. And I quickly realized that first, it often takes much more than one line of code. And second, access to a lot of data does not come for free either. And um, so my second uh, typically viewpoint on um, decision support applications was um, like this layered one where, where you have the database uh, in the bottom, you have the logic uh, in between, and then the UI, which I would include the visualizations uh, to um, at the top. And um, I thought, okay, um, I have to focus on something. So I focused on the logic side. I thought this was my very naive thinking. I, I am able to abstract from the database and I'm able to abstract from the UI and just focus on the logic. And let's see how that worked in academia first. What challenges did I have in academia? I had um, here, the unstructured data, distributed data, numeric data, web scale data, graph data, and so on. And just to have a look and, uh, at those unstructured data, uh, one of the reasons um, I, I probably then started at KIT, at the group of Rudi Studer, was that they were actually able to build a really great application. I'm not sure whether you've heard of it, um, it's Semantic Media Wiki. It is uh, built on top of Wikipedia or Media Wiki, at least Media Wiki, the technology behind Wikipedia. And um, 
it allows um, so media wiki by itself would just allow to do something like this um, right benedict is interested in linked data and then this gets uh, stored and displayed but when i would then want to know uh, what is the research interest of all colleagues um, i would not be able to answer this question using uh, wikipedia so that um, that is why semantic media wiki was um, invented and it allows to annotate these um, these pages like um, benedict is interested in linked data or his uh, uh, research interest is linked data and he is of the category employee and I, uh, also um, on top of that i was um, you can just have a visualization or you give it structure you have give it a tabular structure and you give it forms so that i can just fill in forms and and uh, then what comes for free is the ability to um, ask questions to, to, to the system and have um, in, the, um, in the wiki uh, displayed lists or table, tables of um, all the employees and their research interests. And this fascinated me so much because uh, I thought, okay, this, um, I only have to look at the modeling and the, in the how to structure unstructured data to structured data. And then the database comes for free and the visualization comes for free. Uh, this I liked a lot because it helped me with the uh, focus um, topic and I, I i used it in a in many many applications for example we used uh, such a wiki for the iso 9001 quality management at our group where we had all the research projects um, managed and all the reviews about the research projects so that there was an audit we only had to show the wiki and basically everything else went smoothly. Um, or um, um, another example, we, we allowed researchers, politicians or technicians from the lower Jordan Valley, uh, like Palestinians, um, uh, Israel, people from Israel, um, share knowledge about water resources management. Um, this, this was something really nice that and to have the, these people that do not typically talk to each other um, would actually speak about water resources management using uh, such a semantic media wiki. And um, for example, this information about some springs and another example, we, we made physicians share their data about anonymized patients for treatment recommendations about liver surgery. And um, of course, the actual magic for me happened with the data, but um, at least the visualizations and the database uh, were an important part of the application and um, again came, came for free basically. A second example, uh, another challenge in decision support applications that I come upon was distribution. Uh, so that uh, now we spoke about all the information is in, in one wiki, and that's fine for many applications, but typically um, you have uh, information in many silos and you have them distributed. And there I got very much involved in the semantic web standardization of the W3C, the World Wide Web Consortium. Tim Berners-Lee, the uh, inventor of the web, wrote down a couple of recommendations of how to publish data via the web for st structured data sharing, like um, use URIs as names for things, use HTTP URIs so that uh, people can, can look up those names. When someone looks up a URI, provide useful information using the standards, RDF and Sparkle, and finally include links to other things so that um, you can discover more about your thing. And Tim Berners-Lee even, um, and I found this quite clever, he even included a visualization of the grade of openness data um, that, that data, um, and that published data is. And uh, up to uh, a five-star linked open data um, would, would, be, um, would include all of these. And, and a one star would just mean, okay, use an open license, for example. And by, by, this, by these uh, recommendations that Tim Berners-Lee formulated, a community started um, that, that I happily joined um, that 
uh, started to, to publish five-star linked open data with billions and billions of facts uh, by now. Uh, for example, uh, in 2007, it was, it was all started and there was the US census data included in it. And then during the time, so this is the current version uh, of the linked open data cloud. And um, so all this data was integrated, connected. So, there, so you were able to traverse this large graph and build completely new applications. And um, one example, I know it's a not it's not a uh, it's not a brilliant example, but it's one that I uh, did research about with students was okay. I thought okay now if I have the semantic media wiki and I have um, things described in there, uh, so this is about. Um, social sciences. Josef Spieler is uh, apparently a, a relevant uh, person in, uh, in the social sciences. And if I have Josef Spieler um, described in my semantic media wiki, then of course the World Wide Web, the semantic web, the linked open data cloud also mentions him and mentions him using other uh, different URIs. And you could actually just um, uh, manage these U uh, different URIs, and then you would draw in all the information about Josef Spieler. So that, uh, for example, that he's a, uh, a teacher or his birth date and so on. And this information actually does not come from the wiki, but from the linked open data cloud. So this was a kind of tabular mashup. And during that time, actually, the I also heard it a couple of times today, uh, but mashup is is really interesting um, term because it just means for me to, to put together, visualize together uh, different um, si uh, information that typically are in silos. Um, another challenge, numeric data. Um, of course, some data that uh, eventually found its way to the linked open data um, cloud was uh, were statistics and governmental statistics like from Eurostat, the World Bank, and this helped. And um, publishing it to the linked open data cloud helped because it gave it more structure or more semantics and better ways to integrate or find this data. Um, because you actually had these kind of applications like um, the Eurostat browser, but it, it would not actually not really allow you to find specific information with it. So would, if you would f uh, want to find the um, gross domestic product of the UK in 2010 uh, in Euro, for example, then you could not ask this question directly. You would need to drill down and select and so on. So one thing that we did was, now that we had this all this information from Eurostat in a structured in, uh, uh, format and with semantics attached to it, we just republished it in a search engine optimized presentation or a way. Uh, so every single uh, data point would get its own um, page. Um, and this page, these pages obviously got indexed by Google. And then you could actually ask these kind of questions to Google because Google would find the most specific page. Another challenge, web scale data, like the data is getting larger and larger. And if we really look at the um, linked open data cloud, then we are at web scale data and we have to deal with it maybe a little bit differently. And um, it is also a challenge for interactive uh, analysis. Uh, as an example, we have uh, financial data, financial data that uh, would allow to, to actually get access to structured financial information, even though the, the page uh, looks like this. Uh, for a European, quite a problem. But here you see XBRL. This is the structured um, representation of this financial data. And afterwards, you can actually um, link it also with, um, with financial information that is published by the Securities and Exchange Commission, by the SEC. Um, and um, these kind of 
information, of course, it's it's huge. Uh, it's also published all the time, and the the browsers that were available during that time, uh, like the Graph, Sparkle Query Builder, Vizinaf Link Data Browser, and so on, they were all not capable or well suited for this kind of information. And also, you can imagine that on this financial data, you, you want to do much more analytical analysis than metadata analysis. Um, and for, for these kind of queries, um, you have com completely different or at least complementary requirements to a, a typical operational database. So that the, uh, for me, I, I really had to look more into, uh, onto the, the database side. I, I said at the beginning, I wanted to abstract from it, but uh, starting with this financial data, it was not possible for me to abstract from the database anymore because I had to look into it and how to um, optimize the queries uh, using, for example, materialization or caching and so on. And one application that we developed at that time was the Financial Information Observation System, FIOS, uh, that would both make use of visualization technology. Uh, that means use a low overview first, zoom and filter. Like here, that was an, a Saiku um, um, OLAP analysis tool. And um, finally, details on demand, where we would actually, for the single information, we would then use a browser again, because then we want to look really at the, at the lowest um, granularity of each um, single, single value. And also, so on the visualization side, and also FIOS would make use of specific database technology like uh, materialization and caching. Yeah, graph data, uh, for that, I want to show you an, uh, a visualization. Uh, what we, what I um, cr um, did research about together with SAP on the HANA uh, graph database. This is one example where you actually see, okay, now that we have large amounts of graph data, um, a typical relational database will probably not be sufficient and all the typical visualizations will not be sufficient. Let's have a look at that. Hello, this is Horst Werner. And in this video, I would like to show you how you can use the HANA graph engine and symbiosis for gene analysis. The data was collected and prepared by Benedict Kempken. Here we see a sample of 20 genes, each represented by a colored disk. Let's zoom in on one of them to see the details. I click on this disk and you see that it contains three different areas. We've got the name here, the annotated concepts from the gene ontology here. We can even zoom in to see the definition. And then we have got a set of similar genes below. They are color-coded and sorted by the calculated degree of similarity. There are five highly similar genes on the top and less similar genes on the bottom. If we drill down, we can even see that there is a small number indicating this numerical value of similarity that we use for color coding and sorting. The calculation of this similarity is actually based on the annotations of the genes. So if we look at the top five most similar genes, they actually have annotations in common with our focus gene. Let's quickly confirm this in our work area. So I copy the focus gene and the similar genes, and then I get the related annotations for the single gene and for the group of genes. And then I form the intersection of both. I just drag this set over the other one, select intersect, and here we see that all the three annotations occur in the five genes that are most similar. Let's go back and have a look at the genes that are less similar. In this embedded set, they appear as gray disks. Here, the calculation of similarity is more sophisticated, and let me illustrate this with a graph. Here we see our focus gene and the annotations that are directly associated with it. Here we see the similar genes and the annotations associated with them. 
For pairs of such annotations, a semantic distance can be calculated, and this metric is reflected in the color of the connecting line. So a strong color of the line indicates a semantic proximity of two terms. So roughly speaking, the similarity between genes is calculated by evaluating all the path connecting the annotations between them and aggregating this proximity. Now let's see what we can use this similarity metric for. Let's look at a gene with more annotations, like this here. Again, we copy it to our work area for the analysis. We want to compare it with the similar genes, so we copy this embedded subset too. Now let's get the associated annotations for the gene itself and for the similar genes. If you want to know what is unique about this gene, we need to isolate the annotations it has that the similar genes do not have. So I'm going to subtract the annotations of the similar genes. Now only the annotations that are very specific for this gene are left. We can zoom in to have a closer look. Now some of these are very detailed terms, but we can navigate up the abstraction hierarchy in the gene ontology to get a more general view of these. We do this by traversing and the... With this, I Hello, stop. this. I think you, you get um, what, what is nice about this visualization. I, I really liked it a lot. Uh, um, now you understand me better. So um, I stopped now because um, I think you, you know what, um, what was shown and I really like this visualization. Um, now you have, I hope at least, you have an impression of what visualization meant to me during my research. I actually had to look into visualization techniques as I also had to look into database techniques. And now how did it look like so far for me in industry? If you work, um, as Empolis and Empoli, Empolis was 30 years ago. We were, we were a spin off of the German uh, Research Center for Artificial Intelligence, the FKI, um, because our CEO did his PhD in case based reasoning. And this actually 30 years ago, ago was one of the base technologies or methods for bringing artificial intelligence into industry because that was the way or it was most similar to the way that experts also thought. And with that, artificial intelligence is kind of was with us right from the beginning. And within our company, if you nowadays work on AI applications, you, you have several challenges. One of them, is surely there are tremendous achievements in AI, such as you all know it, AlphaGo beating the best Go player, even um, AIs um, interpreting radiological images, and there are many more examples. And of course, there are tremendous achievements, but from the media and from other companies' marketing, you may always think, oh, everything already is possible using AI. And there, is, there really is sometimes some exaggeration of what is possible um, just by giving um, systems more intelligence. And I, you probably will agree when you, uh, if I say, no, it's, it is the combination. It is the combination of humans and machines. And um, we, we have this, this view on um, artificial intelligence, uh, a little AI, actually this, uh, I, I, I just thought this, this fits, a little AI goes a long way. You don't need to uh, put as much um, artificial intelligence into your applications as possible. Rather, you, uh, our solutions and uh, for that, we, we would also use visualization techniques, uh, techniques if they help us more. They need to solve our or their, their, the business goals of our customers. No more, no less. 
they should be for the user. And this especially is the case since we do not want to overcomplicate things. Um, building solutions that for the user seem to be magic. This is something, of course, that is our uh, endeavor. They, they the actually they, they require engineering, they require knowledge management, experience, teamwork, and for me, all, most of all, interdisciplinarity. And this is something that is, that is very important. It's much more important than using the newest uh, language model in natural language processing. This is also because most of the time you still have most problems in data availability, data quality, explainability, and comprehensibility. For example, you most often you have unbalanced data. You have few examples, but mostly you have examples that are not so interested, interesting. Or you just have so many dimensions um, or um, so few dimensions that your data is undistinguishable just gets a gray mess and one all, one funny thing also um, in in industry is that you may maybe you know this um, from John McCarthy one of the artificial intelligence um, godfathers as soon as it works no one calls it AI anymore like Alexa for example or um, routing root planner for example and um, um, so it, this is something that uh, we as industry, um, we, the, these are one of our challenges. Um, and now I, I brought with me two examples of now applying clever, intelligent solutions to industrial problems. The first one is in customer service. There are huge uh, changes in customer service. Uh, customers like, for example, um, Vodafone um, end users uh, calling uh, at Vodafone or um, uh, a uh, company buying a huge printer from Koenig and Bauer or a robot from KUKA, um, they expect Technicians of my producer immediately notice and solve problems with the product. And the question is, is are these companies ready to provide this kind of service? And this is not so easy because products nowadays get more and more complex. Come uh, like um, look at the the automobile or uh, uh, um, in the automotive industry, for example. Also, the fluctuation of expert knowledge or still effort some search for information. These are all problems that companies such as KUKA, Vodafone, Koenig and Bauer, BMW, and so on, and so on have. So they, they, they do and they need to include intelligent systems in their customer service. And one of these systems is Service Express. This is um, uh, one of our products. And I want to give you a, a couple of examples of how a little bit of uh, artificial intelligence is included in, uh, in the product. Here you have intelligent search over um, heterogeneity of documents. So you can imagine that um, within documents, um, concepts are all the time described a little bit differently. You have spelling errors in the search query. You want to search as you would do it in, in Google. And this you would, you would have via intelligent search. Another example. Um, guided troubles uh, uh, shooting. This means that you would uh, get a um, questions. You, you don't need to look for something, to search for something, but rather you get questions by the systems um, uh, to guide you uh, through your problem and until your solution, to your solution. Or 
of course, machine data analysis. This is one, again, one of the problems with the rare problems, many dimensions. And what can you do there? One of the things that you can do is actually exploration. So allow explorative analysis through sensor data, um, allow the user to, to, to look through the data. or knowledge graph. So if your data becomes so complex because it's connected so much that you, you, you still want to get an overview of it, then you, you mix um, complex data structure like graph with the information seeking mantra of overview first, zoom and filter details on demand. Or the example, If you want to, so, so you know that nowadays this with Alexa, this comes more and more like speech-based applications where you uh, are able to talk to a, a chatbot in a quite human way and get immediate help with specific uh, problems. One example I already mentioned, KUKA, KUKA Expert um, is uh, one of the customers that actually have such a portal um, with all of their um, access mechanisms like uh, via an uh, app um, or via this um, search um, interface. And I don't want to go into the details of how often it is used. It's, it's quite uh, heavily used. Um, you have very um, different kind of queries that are typically posed to the system. But what I find very interesting is that KUKA actually built up their own business model around it because they built up a self-service portal also for customers. So not only for the technicians, but rather for the customers. And they charge the customer for specific information about their products that they typically would not need to use for just for simple um, uh, usage, but rather more detailed information. They do uh, get it um, um, pay per use in a pay per use model. Okay, second example, we, we have the customer service. Another example um, of an application area that we work in with decision support systems is uh, radiology in uh, healthcare. So uh, quite similar to, to the technician before, here we have physicians that from their radiologists expect the radiological report in due time, correct and comprehensible. And there are quite a few problems with that. And to illustrate this, if you take three radiologists looking at the same radiological image, you would typically get three totally different reports because there is almost no standardization. And also the, the, the radiologists, they want to use speech recognition. They are very fast with that. So they just, um, they, they, um, that's their fastest way uh, to, to do radiological reporting. But of course, this is very bad for decision support or for quality management. And how difficult that is, uh, you see, for example, from these diagrams on the left, you have the unique terms in a bunch of radiological reports. And on the right, you have the usage of those. And this means that radiologists seem to invent new words all the time. Uh, of course, it's because of spelling errors. And of course, the, the area is very broad and very complex. But it is very difficult to train systems to, to very uh, well understand these free text radiological reports. Another example is uh, negation detection. So try for yourself to find whether hydronephrosis is affirmed or not. And um, it, it is not so easy, but on the other hand, it is actually possible using systems, but of course these systems need to, to be a little bit um, intelligent. Another problem, 
annotation. Um, of course, you need to feed into the system uh, some training data and to build up training data using uh, physicians is not so easy because they, of course, they, they want to uh, um, do not sit there and annotate uh, radiological reports all the time. They do not have the time uh, nerve for that. So you, we need something that is very easy to use where, you, where they just uh, mark some words and they mark some part of the sentence as negated or as affirmed um, or as speculated, as you see here um, in, this, um, in this screenshot. And then afterwards, the, the system learns with it and does segment detection, concept detection, context detection, um, uh, and then explainable classification or prognosis on the data. Another uh, important issue, of course, ex is explainability. Sorry for the ex um, German example again. This is an op uh, surgical report. You have one surgical report. You have, um, um, I make a break. So you see here that the system um, uh, tells the user that uh, it thinks it is a certain kind of procedure, is a laparotomy. Um, and uh, this kind of surgery is, is done. Um, and it also explains it, um, why it shows it like that. And now if we proceed and we use another report, and this report is actually the same text, but it includes in the middle some more information about some other procedure, which is much more important. And this is the uh, one that you want to actually recognize in this, in this uh, report. Then here, you see that it actually is able to switch their probabilities to, uh, to, this, um, to this other operation category and also explains it why. Interactive analy analytics, another, ex another challenge, of course, we used Kibana, for example, for that. Um, so um, radiologists uh, see on first sight, okay, how many reports do they analyze? What are their uh, properties? And they can um, do the information seeking mantra again. Another challenge, how to train the systems more with um, knowledge driven, like with rules, with knowledge graphs, with terminologies, this is the right side, or with more unsupervised learning by using just a vector, um, like embedding, where it just is um, trained on large amounts of uh, radiological reports and lay, uh, trains by itself whether um, certain words are more similar or not. Another challenge, of course, in industry is always who is to deploy and who is to operate. Where for, is it on premise or is it in the cloud? And something for, especially for the visualization community, uh, it is important that the um, applications are embedded in the workflow of the experts, of the knowledge workers. And uh, sometimes we even we want to embed our results into used um, uh, workstations. And that's one of the reasons that uh, we would sometimes not use a very great visualization because users are not used to it. They use um, their, their applications and want to have the results um, presented in their um, noun uh, workstations. Um, we have hybrid report. This so now I'm at the examples. I'm already almost at the end. Um, we have um, one example hybrid reporting with the um, radiology radiology of uh, University of Mainz. Uh, radiologists they typically use a combination of different modalities. They use image analysis, they use structure templates, they use um, speech recognition, and of course, they also use natural language processing to look at the entire report to have some quality uh, assurance done over it. And as an example, look at this application. CCT from 5.7.2017, Punkt Neuzeile. So here, a radiologist um, uses speech recognition. He um, dictates his report and gets um, hints by the system 
uh, in real time on the right side and gets hints on what he should be discussing and what he um, uh, what, what kind of background information could be useful for him. Nicht dislozierte fissurale orbiter Bodenfraktur rechtzeitig Punkt Neuzeile. Okay, I think you get what it meant. So as a summary, challenges in academia and industry for decision support and visualizations. During my 10 years in decision support, I obviously used a lot of visualization techniques. I gave examples such as Semantic Media Wiki that gave us free database and visualizations. I showed linked data which gave us a standard means for data integration and numeric and graph data that put additional challenges to it, but of course also opened it up to interesting use cases in government, financial, finance, or life sciences. And during my work, I actually had to look into visualization techniques as I had to look into database techniques to make the most of it. And in academia, if you are in the visualization community, it obviously per se makes a difference. Um, um, what does it take to have something built on top of something? Semantic Media Wiki is a great example. It takes community building and, and even require great visualization to rise interest. Like, like five star linked data. And if you do research around decision support, there seems to me not much difference between industry and academia to make something um, applicable or applied. Um, no matter how you help in decision making, visualization techniques um, uh, will help. And especially if you look at the experts of what kind of um, uh, tools these experts already use and what would help them to, to have um, better decisions. And of course, in, in industry, you might have stricter limitations. The solutions need to be very much adapted to the audience. But in a way, I have to say, there is not so much difference in the applicability of visualization techniques in academia or in industry for me so far. And uh, what would it take to have our company apply a visualization if our customers use it? If they used a visualization, then we immediately would take over this visualization and try to enhance it and to use it. Um, for, for us, of course, um, there are many interesting open work in, in the visualization side. So just as an example, augmented realities, this is something that of course we, we look very deeply into it. We, we are very interested in it and um, how the field will evolve. And I'm pretty sure that visualization has a lot um, to do with it. So I'm uh, looking forward to it. And as a take home message, do not worry. As an academia um, research community, if results are not applied in industry too often, it's more you inspire them still, and 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 very sure that visualization will become even more important in the future, as I showed you uh, on the last slide. And even with more speech-based applications coming up, the need for visualization will surely not decrease. Uh, just one more example, low-code, no-code programming analytics um, with, um, um, will benefit largely from clever visualizations. And last but not least, I think we need more interdisciplinarity as we have, for example, in this workshop. Thanks again for having me keep up the good work. Thank you. All right, Benedict, thank you very much for this awesome talk. And I hope we're, we will have a lot of questions. So I'm uh, waiting if there's something coming in from our chat. 
I'm uh, also hoping very much uh, that there are some discussions. Thank you. And uh, if not, I'm going to start with, with a question because I was really interested in, uh, like, I see often these attempts that you label data and that you make use of them. And this is actually a really good idea, what I think. But <clears throat> I mean, let's face it, often people are too lazy to do that. And um, so how, how do you deal with that? Yeah, um, actually, we, on the one hand, you, you can try to use unsupervised techniques. Um, and try to, to uh, um, use methods that require as few examples as possible. And of, um, you, you probably need to, to have people annotate uh, some uh, information and you tr can try to make their life easier by, by using great applications, maybe even great visualizations for helping them doing an do annotations. Okay. And how do you deal with um, like uh, words that have synonyms? Like, uh, for example, a lot of people mix up AI with um, neural network or whatever stuff like that. So how? It's a very good example because uh, you have this uh, hypernomy and homonymy, um, um, hyponymy and hypernomy uh, problems that you, um, depending on uh, the application, two words might be for your application totally fine if you use them uh, synonymously uh, as a synonyms but if you then use the data for a different application then you you get you get you you get problems with it so this is a problem um, what you can do there is um, yeah you you need I, I, the, the most important thing is that you find those cases and then you have to uh, decide need to decide uh, case by case and you need to discuss it within the team are these two the same you need to put in experts interdisciplinary work and then you discuss it and then you do it as uh, it's most suitable mm -hmm. so um I mean, you said we shouldn't worry about if our visualizations are not getting applied. Um, I mean, still, it's like, I mean, we all wish for that because then it, we would feel like, okay, this is really something that, that might change the world. So how do you still see the benefit and if it's not going to get applied? I mean, yeah, okay, we might, we might inspire you, but, but what's, I mean, what's the point then if my, if my visualization doesn't get applied? Yeah, there is this, this um, I, I did not mention it, but um, you always have this buy or build problem in industry. You know? So either you um, just buy it, you build it. And um, if you as a research community have some great open source uh, tool, um, then um, if it is well managed um, and it just brings in a lot of um, benefit it might be picked up by industry um, that's for sure there is the possibility yes um, with research papers that do not come with a uh, open source package with it but rather says okay this is how you can implement it in your own environment this is another opportunity yeah mm -hmm. And then I was really um, interested in your statement that you made where you've been like, okay, when are we, when are we going to use your visualizations? And then you said, uh, if our customers want to have it. And how do I know if your customer want, uh, if a customer wants to have it, if I do not really have the possibility to offer it to, to a bigger audience? I mean, you've been, in, you've been to, to academia and you know that you probably don't have the resources to build like a real product that you can offer to people so that you get that feedback. So I guess we're on a chicken and egg problem here somehow. Yeah, that's, that's for sure. Um, um, yeah, I, it's, it's, yeah, um, it's true. If um, we, visualizations in decision uh, support systems typically have a, have a specific audience they have experts and these experts 
they use some tools. Often they use Excel, that's a pity, but often they use Excel in all kinds of domains. And uh, the question is, how do we make them uh, use a visualization instead? a great visualization instead. And um, yeah, there, there are probably millions ways of how, how to do that. And the, you have this chicken egg problem, that's for sure. Um, yeah, it, I don't have an answer to that, I'm sorry. All right. Uh, Thomas Mischko uh, wants to know, how do you feel about the use of open source projects in terms of trust and reliability and all those things that are related to that, uh, particular, particularly in industry? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, actually, I made quite um, a good, uh, good impression, uh, I have a really good impression of uh, about open source um, uh, publications and um, we at Empolis we, we use several open source uh, technologies like Uyima Ruta is an example or Spacey NLP technology um, and like Semantic Media Wiki is used by so many companies uh, in the and, uh, whole world. And these are all great examples. And I, I believe that open source will gain in importance. The problem is that one is open source is not similar to another. So I also built up some open source um, tool one day, OLAP 4LD it's, it's called, I built it during my PhD. And afterwards I was not able to maintain it anymore. So at the moment I would not recommend anyone to use it. Um, maybe, yeah. So, and this is, this is just the problem. Uh, open source tools often get abandoned, I think. Yeah. Okay, so Robin Mark wants to know, how can researchers increase their chance of their risk getting picked up by industry? And what do you think is the most important aspect according to you? Um, I've, I'm not sure whether uh, someone of you knows Streamlit. Streamlit is, is a uh, Python uh, library for um, building um, um, Python applications. And I'm not doing a lot of development nowadays, but for me, that was so easy to apply. And I had my, my uh, first application uh, with including a visualization a built in a couple of minutes. And it was a, just a wow effect for me. And this was a really good example of how, how something can um, get their chance increased. I hope that answers the questions a bit. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Then I think according to time, uh, we, we need to shift the discussions into Discord if uh, you do get further questions and if you're interested in staying a bit longer. And uh, now I would say we can try to let um, our first speaker redo his talk, Mark. And I would really like to thank you again for this really nice talk uh, and showing us uh, all these nice perspective from industry that is really important for our community, I think. And I uh, would really like to thank you that you've been here today, Bernadette. Thank you very much for the questions. If uh, any questions come up, please contact me via LinkedIn, Twitter, and so on. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, uh, so you all heard about Mark so far, uh, and he already actually already gave his talk, but unfortunately we had some technical issues to uh, shift it to YouTube, so now he gets the chance to redo his talk, and then if you have further questions to him, you can uh, contact him on Discord or any other possibility. All right, Mark, the stage is yours again.
All right, hello again, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark, and I'd like to present the paper called Tools for Virtual Reality Visualization of Highly Detailed Meshes. But before I do that, I'd like to talk about a painting. It's a painting by Van Gogh, and it's from 1888. It's of his chair. And let's say that we want to analyze the painting style that Van Gogh has used um, for this painting. So it's an oil on canvas painting, and manipulating and touching this painting would be detrimental for the, for the actual painting. So what we would do instead is we would make a 3D scan of it and then analyze it on the computer. When we do 3D scans, we need to think a little bit about the resolution that we do them at. Here are three different resolutions. There's 1,000 points per millimeter squared, 2,500 points per millimeter squared, and 10,000 points. And we can see that the more points per square millimeter we have, the higher the resolution. And we need quite a high resolution to look at the painting strokes and see the details of the different layers of oil on top of each other. So if we do some quick math and we um, take the middle ground, which is 2,500 points per square millimeter, then we get around 1.7 billion points. And these can get turned into a 3D mesh, which will have around 850 million triangles. So this is quite a big mesh. But luckily for us, it's just a painting. So we can just convert it to an image. And with the mouse that has three degrees of freedom, that's all we really need in order to navigate this uh, image because we can use the mouse to scroll, you know, to move up and down the image and we can use the scroll wheel to scroll in and out. But what if we were to scan a 3D object instead of a painting? Then we would no longer meet the requirements by just using the mouse we would essentially have to not only move up and down and in and out, but also rotate the, the mesh. And this is not really feasible with the mouse on its own. So we need to do some kind of mapping from our three degrees of freedom of the mouse onto the six degrees of freedom in the virtual world. And this can be quite intuitive and cumbersome, especially as the data sets get large. And as we saw with the painting, we really do have large data sets now. So, we uh, would like to inspect or we would like to look for new modalities for inspecting these large 3D data sets. One of these modalities could be virtual reality. Virtual reality is quite intuitive to use in the sense that the camera is attached to your head and your controllers, they're already in three dimensions. So you can rotate and move these and use the six degrees of freedom that will then, then be mapped directly to the virtual environment. But uh, using virtual reality also has its caveats. One of these is that we require high performance in order to uh, create a pleasant experience. If we have low performance or a lot of variance in the frame rate, then we will end up making people cyber sick. And that is not really ideal because then they won't get a lot out of the inspection. So how do we mitigate this? Well, one way to do it is to decimate the meshes. In, in, in essence, we take our large mesh and then we collapse some of the points of vertices into each other. This is problematic, however, because one of the reasons we're inspecting the meshes is that we're interested in the details. So decimation really means that we get rid of these details, not only the geometric details, but with scannings, the points also carry texture information. So this all gets collapsed in, in and then disappears. So this is not good. Instead, what we can do is we can investigate where we get the best performance. So this is what we do in this paper. We look at different places to start. What is a good foundation for a virtual reality-based uh, visualization tool? And we, we do that by carrying out a small experiment. And uh, we'll talk about that experiment. We'll talk about the results. And we'll look a little bit about the future works that we can do to make the visualization even better. But before we do that, we have to start with looking at the different uh, models that we're using. And these come from different research areas that we think could uh, gain a lot from having a virtual reality-based inspection tool. So the first is uh, cultural heritage, where the 3D scans allow for some workflows that could be destructive to the actual objects. And the actual objects could be brittle or valuable or scarce. And because of that, you'd rather want to manipulate a three-dimensional replica or digital twin of it. Another research area is shape generation, where we are in this experiment, we use a wing that has been finite element model and is quite large. And the largest model in our data set, 
And then we look at 3D printing, where it's interesting to inspect our models before they get printed and see if they look exactly how we want to. Because some of these 3D prints, they take a lot of time. And in this data set, we use an octopus called Nobby. And as we can see here, we have three models. None of them have uh, 850 million triangles. Um, so we're nowhere near the Van Gogh painting, but we still manage to um, push the systems for performance. The experiment itself has two setups. We have a high performance setup with a stationary PC and a valve index. And then we have a low performance setup with a laptop and an Oculus Quest. We inspect the meshes from two uh, views. We have one where we see the entire mesh from afar to get the big details. And then we have one where we look at the meshes up close, where we look at some of the smaller details. Every uh, experiment is carried out in virtual reality. So, and we do this through Steam VR. And Steam VR actually outputs the average render time in milliseconds, or it outputs the render time in milliseconds. And then we take the average of that. And if we want to hit 80 FPS, which is a good target or threshold to look at, then we need uh, 8.5 milliseconds on average for each frame. So, the simple approach is to use Unity and Paravi. And we did that. And it was very easy to set these up. Uh, it took about half an hour, and then we're running in virtual reality. And, and let me just go through the plots here so that we can see what's going on. So on the y-axis here, we have the milliseconds. And this is the average render time. On the x-axis, we have the two bars here that are blue. That's for the skull. The two orange bars is for the wing. And the two green bars, that's for Nobby, the octopus. And the red line here is the 12 and a half milliseconds threshold that we're aiming for. So yeah, each bar has an average render time. The whiskers, that's the variance. And the semi-transparent bars, that's the low performance setup. And the fully opaque bars here, that is the high performance setup that we named index. The flat shaded bars, those are the experiment where we look at the model from far away. And the cross-hatched bars, both ways are the ones where we look at the model up close. All right, so with Paraview, we get better performance overall than Unity, but we have high variance, and this is not great. With Unity only, the skull is below the, the threshold, so we need to do more. And what we can do is we can optimize Unity quite easily. We can check some boxes and change the rendering pipeline. We change it to the universal render pipeline, which is often used for mobile games and uh, optimized for low-end hardware. And then we used a local lighting model with a Fong shader, and we allowed Unity to optimize the mesh. So this means that it gets to, to optimize how it renders it, but not reduce the number of triangles. If we compare these two solutions, then we can see that uh, we gain a lot of performance by optimizing Unity. And this is really interesting, right? But what actually is it that gives us this performance boost? That is what we will investigate now. And in order to do that more transparently, we created our own engine, which is uh, a Vulkan and C++-based engine. We named it Jinsuku, and it gives us the ability to have a white box approach to looking at different performances. And we also do believe that creating our own platform gives us a better starting point for testing out things and using state-of-the-art um, rendering techniques. But uh, in this case, we compare it to Unity, and we can see here that if we have the same pipeline, the same shader, Unity still does a lot better, especially for the Nobby, which are the green bars. And the only difference here is actually the mesh optimization. So clearly, the mesh optimization does a lot for performance. So let's look closer at that. So there's two ways we can optimize the mesh. One is through the triangle scripts that are used. And here, we have all the points, which we will call vertices now. And these vertices, they're turned into triangles that are then drawn on the screen. Triangles are connected to each other. And that means we can create this triangle strip and then feed it to the GPU. And then it will, will process the triangles in the order defined by the triangle strip. Let's say that we process the first three vertices. Then we can uh, draw the first triangle. Then we only need to process one vertex more in order to render the next triangle. And this is because on old GPUs, we have what's called a post transform and cache and lighting cache, which holds the vertices that have been transformed. 
So if we can optimize the reuse, meaning that we draw all the triangles that are using these three vertices, then we only have to process them once. So by optimizing the triangle strip for the reuse of vertices, we can increase performance. Another way we can increase performance is on modern architectures, we can use a meshed representation. And in general, GPUs have moved from being a deeply pipeline piece of hardware to a massively parallel piece of hardware. So now we can use meshlets and we can take our mesh and divide it into these patches that we can see here on the Stanford Bunny. Each patch, patch is a meshlet and all the meshlets can be uh, processed in parallel. Now, this is leaning towards a compute-based um, rendering model with the task and mesh shading pipeline. And this gives us some flexibility that we, so that we can encode and compress the vertex and index data. And we can also calculate some metadata that can be used for, for instance, culling. So we can look at the meshlets before we process them and say, is this actually visible? And if it is visible, we process it. If it isn't, we don't. And now we can look at the two different optimizations here and we can see that with the meshlets, so using a mesh shading pipeline over here, it doesn't work out very well for Nobby, but for the skull, we gain good performance on both the low and high end setup. And for the wing, I think it's even more pronounced that we get this big difference in, in the render times when we inspect the mesh up close compared to when we inspect it from afar. And this is really the, the product of the mesh shading pipeline calling all the meshes that are invisible. Whereas when we inspect the entire mesh, it has to process almost all of the meshes. When we look at the triangle strip optimization, we can see that not using it, so this is the skull not using the optimization, and this is the skull with optimization. We gain further performance, even though we're using a, a modern GPU with a mesh shaded pipeline. And this is because increased reuse of vertices means that the vertices are spread out on fewer meshes. So this actually all helps. But I mean, what's up with Nobby? Why is it always acting so strangely? We need to have a closer look at it. So on the left, we have the bunny and it has some meshlets and they're sort of looking like we expect the meshlets to look and how we want them to look. If we look at the right, we can see that the Nobby meshlets do not look like that. They look like elongated tubes, which makes sense when you think about that it's a mesh that is created for 3D printing. So when you 3D print objects, you, you get this kind of structure uh, typically on some 3D printers. And this is reflected in the meshlets because the meshlet generator we use takes the index buffer and then just chops it up into meshlet sized pieces and then processes those. And this is really bad because an elongated tube or cylinder is actually visible from all angles. So that means that we actually end up processing all the meshlets, even those that are back facing or behind in the model. So clearly there's, there's room for improvement in the meshlet generation department. If we uh, compare our optimized Unity with Jinsuku using this mesh shading pipeline and the optimized meshes, we can see that for Unity, we are slightly worse, but it's negligible with the skull. So that's kind of the same. Unity is using a vertex shading pipeline. And that means that if you can see part of the mesh, such as the wing here, it has to process the entire wing. That is why we have very similar performance on both far and close up inspections. And this is really where the mesh shading pipeline shines, that it actually gives us almost the same performance as with the skull, even though the mesh is more than twice as big when we inspect it up close. Nobby is, is more well processed in Unity without a doubt. So if we sum it up here, I don't think it's surprising, but the mesh representation is really critical for a good performance. The larger it gets, the more time we have to spend processing. The task and mesh shading pipeline, they show great promise because as data sets get larger, it becomes more part of, of the process to inspect it up close and only look at part of it. And here the mesh shading pipeline really gives a great um, utility to visualize large meshes, but only look at part of it at a time. And also we found that a naive Vulkan implementation in some cases can compete with an optimized version of Unity. Alibi, this is at the cost of a much longer production time. Finally, I'd like to show you where we're currently at. So we've decided to continue onwards with Jinsuku because it gives us some possibilities that we don't have with the Unity uh, URP pipeline. 
And we can see here that with some optimization techniques, we actually managed to get better performance. So the, the opaque bars that is Jinsuku and the semi-transparent bars, that's Unity. It's only when we view the wing from afar that Unity does better. That was all, thank you. All right. Thank you again, Mark, for doing your talk again. Uh, we're super sorry that we had this te technical issues and it's really awesome of you that you really did the effort and did it twice. I would like to welcome everyone who attended the talk now to post some questions for Mark uh, in, on Discord or on YouTube uh, later on. So uh, we, we really like to, to share you or give you some feedback on your work. Um, nevertheless, uh, I would like to uh, close the session and close this gap in general. So um, to summarize this, we had two invited talks, one by Timo Wopinski and uh, the capstone by Benedict Kempen. And we had four paper presentations with joint discussions for each of those sessions. And we had in, in general uh, lively discussions with almost 40 part uh, participants. Uh, so I would really want to uh, show you what's going to be next. Uh, we would like to hear your feedback. So how did you like the workshop? How was the length? Uh, how could we improve this? So if you have any thoughts on that, please uh, don't hesitate to write us on Discord or email us. And uh, you can also participate on Reddit. What we're going to do next is we're going to have um, to continue this discussion on how we're going to close this gap. Uh, and we uh, got a uh, Shonan seminar uh, accepted, which is going to be exactly on that border, uh, which is got, uh, organized by myself, Takayuka Ito, Michael Krona, Alexander Lex, and Guido Reiner. And you can uh, access this uh, seminar already and see what the topic ex is exactly about. Um, I would like to thank all the speakers again uh, for their really nice talks and all the participants and all the people that participated in discussions. And we really hope to see you next year in Rome and not online. And so I would like to close this gap in general and have wish you a lot of fun for the rest of the week with Eurovis. Bye. <laughs>